Just want to welcome everybody to Tech Talks today. Thanks so much for joining us for our PPRP response rally. Um, I'm Jane Osler, and Mike and I are excited to provide you with updates and information about response rates, phone calling, new dashboards that are available in Tableau, and so much more. If you're new here, we um, just want to welcome you to our training and Please say hello in the chat and tell us which EMSC state program you're with. Uh, we want to thank Jane Lowe for monitoring the chat for us today. And you'll remember that the monthly challenge for this month was to share PPRP response strategies with your TA that are effective in your state. This could be anything from utilizing your FAN, your advisory committee, promotions that you're doing. Um, and I just want to thank everybody that responded. I know you all met at Senso recently and shared a lot of these things uh, with each other, too. So we'll discuss these more closer to the end. But if you have additional thoughts that you want to share, please feel free to put those in the chat. And I'm going to go ahead and let Mike take it away. All right. Thanks, Jane. Hi, everybody. Nice to nice to see you, at least see your names on the screen. Um, so yeah, we are uh, excited to talk today a little bit about uh, just where we are with PPRP and and all your awesome efforts. Um, we are officially at 30% response rate. We hit that yesterday with, uh, and we're just over 4,600 responses in the database. So that is really fantastic. I mean, if we, if we didn't get any more responses, which of course we will, but if we didn't, I mean, 4,600 responses is still, that's a lot of agencies. So uh, awesome work to all of you managers for for, for your efforts and and um, we're we are we're on our way to to you know boosting that rate even more. I think you all know that we're in the um, you know basically we sent out all the all, you know the invitations and reminders on the schedules that they were set at and and now we're in the basically these last five six weeks are in the phone calling stage so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, during this call. Um, next slide, Jane. So just, just by way of comparison, I just want to show you, you know, we did our field test earlier this year with North Carolina and New Jersey and CNMI. Um, and when we started the phone calling progress or process with them, that was about February 19th, roughly. That was about, you know, the six week mark. And we were at 24.1% uh, response rate at that time with the field test. So we are, when we started the phone calling process, which was last Thursday, June 20th. That was sort of the, you know, official start, but, you know, that may have started a little earlier with some dates, but um, we were at 26.7%. So very favorable, a little bit even better than the field test. So that's good. And again, that's because of your, all of your good efforts up to that point. So, um, so that's a positive. Um, let's see, next slide, Jane. Um, and the good news about the field test is, is, you know, over the those last six weeks of the field test, um, the we were able to, we were able to actually I mean more than double our response rate. We ended up with a sixty percent total response rate uh, in the field test, and um, you know, again Eric and Greg did a great job, and and and, and the folks from CNMI, and and we know that there are, you know, probably particularly Eric has some has some resources, the advantage of some resources that not all states are going to have, so we're not. You know, this won't be possible for everybody to get uh, probably the response rate that he got because he got 100%. But the point is, is that the phone calling really can make a difference. And so we're going to um, really talk about some of those techniques um, uh, during this call. Let's see, next slide. Uh, and just, just the impact so far. So we started, again, you know, several states have asked for our help in making phone calls to the non-responding agencies in their states, which we're happy to do. Uh, and, and at any point, other states can, you know, request help. Uh, so there's no, there's not a deadline for that. Um, but as of last, when we started phone calling last Thursday, we've made about 442 calls to agencies um, over the, just internally, just, just our, just our share of that at EDC. And at least 77 of those have completed the assessment, probably more actually, because many of those calls, these, these are numbers as of yesterday. And um, a lot of those calls were made just yesterday. So probably some more are going to complete the assessment based on the phone calls. So that's, you know, approaching a 20%, uh, a 20 sort of response rate from the phone calls, you know, of, of those that were making contact with or completing the assessment. So it really does uh, make a difference. Um, 
And again, whether whether you know states are calling making phone calls themselves or we're helping or however, uh, that process will go through the end of July. And if any if if any of you have not are not sure if you you know you want help but but not want more information on on getting help from us, please reach out to your uh, your TA on that. There's a request form and we can easily send that to you and and help you out with making phone calls if you'd like. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Jane now to talk a little bit more about the specifics of phone calling, some techniques and, and things. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. And I think Jane Lowe's um, going to put that link to the phone calling request form in the chat as well. So thanks so much, Jane. Um, Braden sent out some information a couple weeks ago that included um, the tracking sheet for phone calling non-responding agencies, the EMS and fire rescue scripts, some follow-up email templates, and then um, I'll go over those first and then I'll talk about how we can also set the stage for successful phone calling going forward. So I'm going to take us off road for just a second here. And um, if you have any questions, by all means, feel free to put that in the chat there. Let me just go ahead and I'll share my screen one more time. And, and Jane, Mark, Mark did uh -huh. ask a question about when, you know, how often we are able to reach somebody via phone and then how long a call may actually take when we talk to somebody. And you guys know more about this. And Jane, maybe you can talk about it. But I'd say yeah. a, lot of time, a lot of times you're actually leaving a voice message. But um, maybe talk about how long the calls take when you actually reach somebody. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the answer to that question is it depends <laughs> on a lot of variables. Uh, typically, we're able to get through about 10 to 15 calls in about an hour period of time if you're really in a good rhythm. Um, we've been doing this for a long time as well. So it just kind of depends on your engagement with the agency while you're on the phone. You know, some, you know, leaving a voice message, of course, takes a lot less time than if you're talking to an actual person. But we've averaged about 10 to 15 calls per hour. So um, I hope that helps to clarify that. We also make it a point to call as early as possible in the day between like 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. local time, knowing that someone is just barely getting started with their day. And if you catch them right at the beginning of the day, they're more likely to um, respond. So um, I hope that answers your question. And um I just wanted us to look at the tracking sheet. This is for um, the download of your non-responding EMS and fire rescue agencies. You can see there's lots of information here, but the most important point of this sheet is this is just a way to help you to put information you get on a call into so we this. See your email. Yeah, we're oh, looking at your email right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. thank you for letting me know. I appreciate that. Let me see if I can share screen in a different way here. Thank you. How's that? Can you see it now? Yeah, I can see the tracking sheet. Okay, super. Thank you for that. So this tracking sheet, you'll notice, has lots of information, um, including a color key that indicates what happened on the call. Um, if it's red, it might have been no answer, or maybe you get a fax machine, machine trill. Um, if it's yellow, it could be that you left a voice message. If it's blue, it just means that you talk to an actual person, but maybe not the person that you know you wanted to talk to, and you left a message, um, you know, at the at the station. And then we'd love to see green. Um, green means that they agreed to take the assessment. And you'll notice also in the details column right here that every single one of these um, I send an email for. Um, that's two points of contact instead of just one, and it's following up to make sure that people know that you are serious about them wanting to take the assessment. Um, it's also great to have this tracking sheet because if you haven't marked anything yet, you know that the white line is the next person that you're going to call. So when you're on the call, you don't make the mistake of saying someone else's name. So it's just kind of a nice visual way to keep you on track. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull open the calling script. Let me know if you're not seeing it here on the screen. You see that okay? Yep. I'll take that as yes. Thank you so much. So this calling script that you received from Braden has just some notes and information about what we're doing with the script and how to read it. So we have green sections right here that indicate a live response. We have yellow sections that indicate an area for a voicemail, if you're leaving a voicemail message. 
And then we also have a red area. This could be someone hung up on you or it's the wrong phone number or something um, that happened that just needs, you know, to end the call. And then it gives you follow up information on that. In each live response, um, we also have a greeting um, that we use either for a manager or for program staff. Um, we use um, a purpose section in case someone's asking about the purpose of the project and then an invitation. And the in invitation always includes the link to the assessment. Um, it talks about a little bit about how long it's going to take, but that they complete, they can complete it in more than one session, and that their responses are confidential. The great thing about this invitation section is that I love, love, love to remind people that they get a gap report out of this. They get access to resources. And so we're giving back and we're trying to work collaboratively collaboratively with someone on pediatric readiness. I'm just gonna um, make this one page here so we can take a closer look. You'll also notice that there are sections here in red. These are areas where you would be inserting either your name or the state name. Um, you definitely wouldn't want to read this verbatim and say, hello, my name is your name and I am the state name, state EMS for children program manager. You don't wanna say that. Uh, make sure that you take the time to type your name in there. Um, the brain learns by doing, and the more you read something verbatim, the more you're going to um, say that. So you wanna come across clear. The EMS agency contact is going to change each time based on your calling script. So you're not gonna to wanna to change that, but just remember that the EMS agency name might be something that you include, um, or the EMS agency contact rather. So, you know, Chief Jones or Chief Martinez, whoever that person is with, that's where you would insert that information. You also want to make sure that when you're issuing an invitation, you can clarify their email address. Um, I always say I'm happy to uh, email you the survey link again at you know bob.jones at ems.gov. Um, and that clarifies with them, oh, hey, wait a minute, that's not the right email address. And then you have the opportunity to get the correct one. I also will enter in my direct phone number. This is not my direct phone number. I'm just using this as an example. But if you type it in there and tell them I want you to call me on my direct line, that tells them that you're serious about this, that you're passionate about this, that you're happy to answer any follow up questions they might have on the call. Um, likewise, you can do the same thing here. Um, with a voicemail. And whenever I come across a voicemail and I say emspedsready.org, I deliberately say it slowly and with great articulation so that if it's the only thing they hear on the voicemail, if they don't even get my email afterward, they're still getting the link to check it out. So that's the script right there. They're broken out between EMS and fire rescue agencies. Of course, just a little bit of change in the language so that we're showing respect for the way they like to hear things. And then we move forward to the um, calling or the follow up email templates. Now, Braden sent three of these um, different templates to you. One is if you talk to an actual person and they agreed to take the assessment. Another template is if you left a voicemail. And then another template, which is my favorite one, is hey, I spoke to a member of your staff. That makes an add a point of contact that you have just educated about the assessment and they might start talking on the back end. So we hope that's the case. You'll also notice on these templates that they are formatted in a table so that when we send them out to people, they stay in this nice clean format and the formatting isn't all over the place. You'll also notice that here in the banner, we've linked it to emspeedsready.org in addition to the button down here. So even if they're clicking around, they'll hit our website. We've also got the video that the EMSC program made, um, they saved my child's life link down here. And then of course you would change areas that are located in the brackets and highlighted in yellow. Now what we like to do at the EDC is we love to go into our Outlook, into our email. And when we are sending off an email to someone, we like to put the template in an actual signature banner. Instead of copying pasting from you know, one document to an email, we go ahead and we come into our signatures and just copy and paste the template into a signature. And then it makes it really fast and easy. Um, I utilized New Hampshire um, just to kind of show you what this looks like. So I've got one for the agreed template, one for spoke with staff, and one for a voicemail. So if I were to go ahead and just click on my signature, 
and I put PPRP agreed like that, the whole template appears and I've already changed the state and all I have to do is change the name. Something else you might notice is that we have this really cute little siren icon that we've added to our subject line. We found that it uh, helps for people to um, have more interest in clicking in the actual email if they see that little icon there. And when it's sent to them, it looks like an emoji. It's red and it's colorful and it's really cute when they see it come through in their email. This is just what it looks like in the subject line. So now I'm gonna kind of go back to kind of some tips and things that we found to be successful over the years um, that we've been doing this. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Let's hope this works okay. And can you see this now? I hope so. Yes. Okay, super. So real quick, some of these things I've mentioned before, but I'm just going to cover them really quickly again. Um, we want to set the stage by making sure that we clear off our desk before a phone calling session, make sure that we close out of any windows on our computer that might ping us, um, especially, you know, if an email pops up, we don't want to be distracted by that email when we're talking to somebody on the phone. Um, we want to also have a calm presence if possible. So if you just finished a meeting and you're going right into phone calling, take a break, take a breather, um, you know, get up, walk around, go outside for a minute and readdress like a new calling session with calm. You'd be surprised at how much it comes through in your voice. If you're stressed, if you're hurried, if you know, you're just wanting to get something done, you really want to make sure that you're calm. The next thing is just basic setup. Um, I talked just about the EMS and fire rescue calling scripts, have that open. Uh, your tracking sheet open, your email templates and your signature open, but you'll also want to have some water, um, pen and paper and a headset. You're going to be talking a lot. And so water really kind of helps to clear your voice. It can save you in a pinch if you get something in your throat in the middle of a sentence. Um, it's really useful to have that. And I can't overstate the importance of having pen and paper in hand. You are going to listen to a lot of phone trees. And those phone trees contain new information sometimes. So you might be calling, you know, Chief Martinez, but they may say, hey, we have a new chief and you'll want to write that down right quickly, um, including like a new phone number sometimes. Sometimes they give you a cell number. You'll want to have pen and paper in hand to write that down quickly so you don't have to listen to the phone tree again. Headsets are awesome. If you can be hands free, that's great. Just make sure you check the sound quality with someone so that they can hear your voice and you can also hear them clearly. The next thing is body language. Um, try to pretend that that person is actually sitting across your desk from you. Um, if you were in an actual meeting, you would be sitting upright. You want to uncross your legs or feet to stay at attention. And the most important thing to do on a call is to smile. Um, if you think about, you know, someone on the other end of a phone, you're like, well, they can't see me. I might as well be, you know, sitting on my couch like I do while I'm watching Netflix. You know, they're going to sense that in your voice, uh, your tone, your cadence, your rhythm, everything comes across through your voice. So if I were to say, hi, I'm Jane Osler. I'm calling from the EMS for children program. I'd really like you to take this assessment. Um, that sounds a little drab, but if I'm smiling and I say, hello, my name is Jane Osler and I'm calling from the EMS for children program. Would you be willing to help us out with an assessment located at emspeedsready.org? You can definitely hear that change come through my voice and it exudes excitement, passion for the project, the fact that you want to generate excitement for them too. And of course, we all need to remember we're doing this for children. Um, focal point is also important. Make sure your focal point is on that tracking sheet. If you're looking all over the room or getting distracted by things going on behind you, that can definitely come through on the call. The last thing that I wanna cover real quickly is that we always, always, always want to practice before we start a new phone calling session. Practice doesn't necessarily make perfect, but we're human. And I think it's great, especially if you're calling first thing in the morning, to get rid of that morning voice, right? We want to, you know, wake up. We want to make sure that our voice is clear. Practice on the tracking sheet saying the name of the person. Um, you may, you know, have information um, that you want to share, but if you get their name wrong, sometimes, you know, it comes up across 
you know, as though you didn't care enough to say their name. Um, practice titles, the agency name, and again, saying pre-hospital pediatric readiness project. Um, I've said this before, but state your state. Again, Idaho State EMS for Children program, Utah State EMS for Children program. Um, make sure you test the sound quality again each time you start a new session. Use names and titles that shows respect for people and for the work that they do. So instead of saying, is Bob available to speak with? Say, is Chief Martinez available to speak with? And be human, especially when you leave a voice message. Um, if you, you know, clear your throat or you say um or you know you cough a little bit something like that in a voicemail it shows them that you're human you're not an ai bot or some type of a recording so i know that's a lot in a very short amount of time but i want to make sure we give some more time to mike to talk now about dashboards right as you're transitioning you have 10 minutes left okay thanks so much thanks jane um so yeah, let's just talk for a minute about response rate dashboards because we want to make sure that you're aware of some of the dashboards that we've created. And I think probably most of you are, but we just want to make sure. Um, uh, first on the state respondent detail um, dashboard, uh, Jane, on the next slide, um, you'll you'll see this is a, uh, there's a tab for basically agencies who've gone in and have almost completed the assessment. Um, they've gotten very near to the end, but haven't actually hit the finish button. Um, and you can see by, by, the, by the question number in that column sort of in the middle where they're at. Uh, we actually have added to that a new marker that literally means they've finished everything. They've answered everything, you know, all gone through all the questions. They just literally have not hit the finish button. So as you're looking at your dashboards, make sure you look at these for this, you know, this, this, this group of agencies that have basically all they have to do is finish um, hit the finish button, or in some cases may have to answer a few more questions, but they're so close to completing the assessment. So uh, just make sure you're monitoring that uh, in your uh, outreach to non-respondents because these these agencies are still considered non-respondents because the database hasn't received their um, you know their the, the completed assessment. Um, next slide. Also, we've created a few new uh, dashboards on the state response rate report dashboard. There's some new tabs there, one, one to show you about the database makeup, and then one to show about the certification type uh, differences, um, and then some new columns in the uh, non-respondents in, in tab and claims. Um, next slide. Uh, so this, Patty had sent this email out last week, but basically this is a, a, a database makeup uh, tab in the um, in the dashboard that shows the the pie chart on the left is basically the um, the the proportion of uh, agencies that are licensed at, at each level in your state. So BLS, ILS, if you have it, and then ALS. In this case, there's about sixty two percent are ALS, twenty two percent ILS, and four almost fifteen percent BLS. The chart on the right shows of the respondents, those who've actually responded to the assessment, then what's their makeup. Um, in terms of the service level. And so you'll see here that the, the proportions actually are pretty, match pretty well. Uh, about 60% is ALS, a little bit, a little bit more ILS and a little bit less ALS than in the, uh, in the chart on the, on the left. What you sort of ideally want is for the chart on the right to mirror the chart on the left. So you know that you're, you're basically getting a good uh, uh, representative response from across service levels based on your um uh the makeup of, of all your agencies in clams so keep an eye on those the, the the there's a set of charts right under it which has to do with transport type uh basically you know whether a transporting agency non-transporting or unknown um because we know that Sometimes uh, managers don't know if their agencies are transport or not, so they they you know keep, keep it as an unknown. But um, what we're seeing in here, and we're we're seeing this kind of across states, is that we tend to be underrepresented with the non-transports. So in this case, you know you've got about sixty-five percent that are transport and twenty-eight percent that are non-transport, at least of what's known. And there's an additional slice that's unknown on the left, <clears throat> but on the right, you can see that. Uh, there's a you know a higher percentage of respondents are the transport and a and a lower percentage are non-transport. So this would indicate really we want to probably start trying to 
maybe make more of an effort to get more responses from our non-transporting agencies just to try to close that gap a little bit and make sure we have uh, more representativeness from the um, non-transport side. And you'll see that a little a little box will actually kick up and say that uh, you know a, a, a certain category is underrepresented if if it meets a certain threshold. So keep your eye on those dashboards in Tableau, and it will help you maybe know a little bit how to target your phone calling as far as um, you know which types of agencies to maybe reach out to first. Um, next slide. Uh, in addition, there's a, a tab that's called Certification Type Difference. Um, it, um, it shows basically uh, what what licensure is listed in plans and then what's reported by the respondent because we um, you know, have a question on the assessment about what licensure level they're at. So the good news about this is at least for all those that in your state that maybe you were, were previously unknown, you now have a response from the agency of what, what their licensure level is. So you can use that to actually populate CLAMS and, and fill in their licensure level um, in CLAMS from unknown to what, what, what it is they put in. You'll see, in some cases, they might you know indicate a different licensure level than you have indicated in CLAMS. So you'll want to use that information just to review that a little bit more and to see if they provided the right answer or um, or, or use what they provided uh, to, uh, uh, to remove your unknown um, in unknown, uh, you know, uh, in CLEMS. Um, next slide. And then um, in CLEMS, you also have a tab well, for, for the non respondents which is what, you know, you will use when you're making your phone calls, you'll refer to this list um, to know who to call of your agencies. We added the um, the columns for highest certification and transport type so that when you, when you uh, download this list from CLEMS to like an Excel spreadsheet, then you can actually sort on those columns. And then, for example, you can... You know, if you're underrepresented on non-transport agencies, then you can start to call them first, or BLS, or ALS, or, or whatever the case may be. So um, you have that information in the non-respondent uh, tab, and then you can download that to uh, Excel and make some, uh, you know, target your um, your phone calling based on that. Two minutes. Okay. I think that's it. Jane, back to you. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, we just want to thank everyone so much for all of the hard work that you're doing on behalf of phone calling. Um, and we also try to take the opportunity each time we talk to an agency to thank them. Thank them for participating. Thank them for all that they do on behalf of our communities, especially on behalf of children. Um, we are just so grateful for um, your support and your work in this efforts, as well as for your suggestions. Um, we had a Quite a few people that got back to us about what the EMSU State Partnership is doing to find success with garnering response. And a lot of these things look like just leveraging your leadership, kind of name dropping or even having leadership send things out for you. Um, utilizing your state licensing systems. Um, some of you have been hosting office hours um, to answer questions, which is fantastic. Collaborating with partner organizations that your agencies are familiar with is a really great idea. And using or establishing regional coordinators or PECs, um, building relationships with those folks to kind of help you in these efforts. In addition to promoting on social media and various websites, um, these are all incredible ideas and I'll be sharing these um, combined um, in a PDF when uh, Kim sends the link out to you all. Um, I'm so sorry we're out of time today. It's been um, really fun to meet with you and discuss the exciting things going on with our data collection. Just mm -hmm. want to let everybody know that next month to focus on PPRP, we will not have Tech Talks in July. Instead, we'll see you um, on August 22nd for the Data Lifecycle Processes, Cleaning, and Analysis with our very own EDC Data Manager, Patty Schmuel. We we look forward to seeing you then and hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Take care.